In this episode of Mind Pump, look, you're listening to the top fitness and health and entertainment podcast in the world. Uh, and what we do in this episode is we answer fitness and health questions asked by our audience. But the way we open the episode is with our introductory conversations where we talk about current events. Sometimes we mention our sponsors and we just have a lot of general fun with our conversation. So here's what went down in this episode. We started out by talking about Justin's inappropriate comment yesterday. Hey, hey on the, uh, the, the I can't help myself. On the live IG story with Dr. Becky Campbell. Uh, he talked about how armed robbers were in his neighborhood. That's kind of scary. Yeah. Adam talked about how maybe the current uh, atmosphere may be promoting the mass legalization of weed. Um, we talked about Dr. Fauci and how he said maybe we should stop shaking hands. I don't think so. I don't think that's yeah, a good come idea. Come on, guy. I talked about the article in the San Francisco Gate that is, uh, they're, they're maybe theorizing that the coronavirus was here in California all the way back into fall of 2019. Interesting. Which would kind of make sense. Uh, and then we talked about how we're going to go do our antibody tests uh, here uh, in a little bit. We also talked about how in New York, uh, the coronaviruses uh, there seem to be rooted from Europe. Uh, and then we mentioned our sponsor, Magic Spoon, and how they're donating boxes of cereal to people who need it. Now, Magic Spoon makes high-protein, very low-sugar cereal, and it tastes like kids' cereal. They're flying off the shelves. Obviously, people are stuck at home right now. They want to comfort themselves with tasty food. Uh, and a lot of people want to make a better choice, though, when they do it. Magic Spoon is a good choice. The protein is from whey protein. Again, it's high in protein, and they have flavors like you know, the, like the, the fruity uh, O's and blueberry and chocolate. I mean, it's really, really good stuff. Here's how you go and get yourself a box of Magic Spoon and get a discount because you're a Mind Pump listener. Go to magicspoon.com forward slash Mind Pump. You will get a discount and free shipping. By the way, there's a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like the cereal, return it for a full refund. Make sure you use the code Mind Pump. Justin then talked about the CEO from Marriott, how much he's donating. Adam went over the top with uh, Jack Dorsey and how he's donating more. The one-upper. I talked about my mobility realization. <laughs> uh, I, then we talked about ancient Late athletes the party. and their performance. And then we talked about UFC fights actually going to be on pay-per-view. Yeah. Way to go, Dana White. Yeah, yeah, gangster. Very, very smart. Uh, then we got into answering the fitness questions. First question. This person's looking to get a machine for cardio. They want to know which ones they should choose. The treadmill, elliptical, rower, and bike. So we talk about the benefits of each. Next question. This person's dad has started working out again, but got terrible form. How can they be helped? So we talked about the importance of mobility and correctional exercise training. The next question. This person has access to our at-home workout program maps anywhere, but they also have kids and they want to know what exercises in the program the kids can do. By the way, Maps Anywhere, during this uh, you know this quarantine period of time, we put it 50% off. It's, a, it's one of our best workout programs that requires just resistance bands, a broomstick, and maybe a, a pull-up uh, bar. So very, very minimal equipment, very effective. This program is going to be half off until things are, are you know settled down. The code for that is WHITE50. That's the word WHITE and the number 50. So make sure you go check that out. And the, the final question, this person's asking about fitness tests, things like a you know 2.4 kilometer run, AMRAP, push-ups and sit-ups and stuff like that. Like, are they really good measures of people's overall fitness? Also, this month, all month long, Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro are both 50% off. Now, Maps Prime takes you through an assessment. It's a self-assessment tool, and it helps you design your warm-ups for your workout, or we like to call them priming sessions because they're far more than just warm-ups. Mm -hmm. They help you connect to the right muscles, establish good form, activate more muscle fibers. Essentially, if you do a good priming session to whatever workout you're doing now, you're going to get better results. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is about correctional exercise. So what you do is you go in the program, you identify the joints of your body that need help, that need extra work, the areas that you think you need better mobility, your hips, your ankles, your wrists, your shoulders, your spine, whatever. Find those areas, follow MAPS Prime Pro to work on mobility and get tremendous progress, okay? Both those programs, 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code 
PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space, for the discount. So yesterday I was on Dr. Becky Campbell's uh, live IG story. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, well, you yeah. know, she, she wanted to ask me questions about, you know, exercising at home, how to stay fit without equipment, mindset. We had a really good conversation. Love her. She's such a personable, funny, just great uh, person. She's got a great uh, following too. Those the, the great yeah. questions. But anyway, so we're talking. Did you see Justin's comment? I didn't. I did. I, I did drop in one point though, and I saw him say that I, I when I came in, he said, "Okay, I gotta get out of here because too many people are are asking him stuff." Yeah. No. So so Justin Justin pops on, and uh, he goes because you know Becky's talking to me, right? So mm -hmm. she's whatever, and so he puts, "Wow, your he goes, your hair is so long and sexy," and put does the uh, the heart uh, you know face or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to Sal. Right. right. <laughs> But I, I, did, I didn't say Sal. Yeah. And no. So she she got all like so, flustered so for a second. Dr. Campbell, yeah. she, she as she as I'm talking, she sees his comment and you know what he said, and she starts laughing. And she goes, "I can't concentrate." And she starts blushing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Justin was directing it towards me. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. I was like, I pulled an atom on that one. I'll 100%. have to go back and listen to it, Doug. You'll have to get on the mic for a second because uh, Justin sounds like he's far away. Yeah, I, I'm not. I can't even hear myself. That's okay. Nobody cares. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, 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 I see. How this is the way. Let's see how this goes. Oh, oh my wait, God. Wait, there I am. Thank wait. God. This is the way we're doing it now, Justin. <laughs> yeah. just hey, guys, I'm in outer space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't forget about me. Yeah, it just sounded like you were way far away. Right we're there. just testing it out, see if we get more downloads. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you got to try it all, you guys. I mean, we tried it without you. It went pretty well. So, yeah, yeah. I think no, it was the most it. downloaded episode, right, Justin? Yeah, at least. Yeah. Yeah. No, we saw the numbers. It was the worst. Numbers yeah. speak for themselves. <laughs> you can't make a cake without the eggs, the milk, and the flour. That's right. the bottom line. Okay. So, yeah. you're the, what? Who's you're the flower? The, you're the, well, you're the whitest. So you're right. obviously the flower. Okay. Yeah, I'm ashy sometimes yeah, too. So, so yeah. I'm the eggs because you're allergic to them. I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not the milk. Uh, yeah. No, bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Milky, milky. Whatever. We make cake. Hey, what happened uh, last night, bro? It, it were in your ghetto, bro. Oh. It's not the ghetto. It's like it's <laughs> it, it's seriously like, like it's so much random things like happen every now and then. But uh, so if you go a mile away, there's. Uh, this this whole complex. You have Safeway, you have CVS, you have, uh, you know, liquor store. So all the essential places, right? So apparently, well, okay. First of all, after the whole thing, I was watching Sal on his live story and everything. I'm like sitting there, I'm like, you know, uh, doing work on the computer, and all of a sudden, I look outside, and there's trucks zipping back and forth at the top of my road with like sirens flashing all this stuff courtney had just left to go to take our our little puppy to the to the vet to get the last shots and she was like oh my god are you seeing this this is crazy like all this you know i just saw like a bunch of guys outside this truck with the, like these huge assault rifles and everything out like looking around for people and, and i was like oh my god what's happening now, dude now be honest are you at that moment thinking to yourself like oh martial, law. martial arts started 100 like percent <laughs> dude i got outside my house and i went up to to the road and then i saw and they were like you know everybody was moving frantically you know and and they were like going out and looking in the bushes and then you know a guy kind of caught my eye and then i was like oh i'm going back in the house <laughs> And I ran back in the house and like I found out later people were texting, I guess uh, word spread out that somebody had uh, held up a CVS down down the road uh, by gunpoint. And so it was like running around, uh, you know, with like carrying uh, like a handgun. And so they were like trying to chase him through all these like forests and everything. And he made his way into like my neighborhood. And so I was like, oh, shit, like locking my doors up and everything. You all know the rest what? Of the neighbors. See, this is when I wish I, I was faster with my reply on your text. Because, Adam, how funny would it have been if he said that? And you said the same thing. And all of us like, yeah. me too. Yeah. Right outside yeah. my house. Yeah. Yeah. They're <laughs> banging on my door. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Just I lost my shit, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah. It was like white truck. And I didn't even, I don't know if these were rangers or, or what. They, were, they weren't They were regular cops because we did have sheriffs because- What's cool too about my area, just to give it credit, is at the end of the road there's like a, a sheriff station. So it's like any, right next to the furry place, right? Yeah, right next to the furries where they all meet and convene and <laughs> eat out of bowls. Yeah, yeah, that's that's Santa Cruz for you. Uh, but yeah, like so, I feel relatively safe where I live, like typically. But 
uh, these were these were trucks I'd never seen before. It looked like almost like unmarked government trucks, and and you know who were these guys with like huge assault rifles and everything? And this was all for a grocery store robbery, or what? What was it? Uh, yes, a CVS. CVS, a CVS robbery. Well, there, how much money are you going to get out of robbing a CVS? Well, I know, right? Do you, would you? Th- I would think, okay, right now because everybody's wearing masks. That this would be like, oh, so, yeah. like stop. Yes, stop. You know, come on, it, it, don't already, encourage it. Come, I'm just saying that somebody has to think this way, right? Like you're if you're a, a criminal yeah. and you're like, I was thinking about robbing a grocery store anyways. Easy to walk in. Yeah. Right. Right yeah. now. My and mask we, and gloves. Right. My mask. I can't get my prints. Exactly. My mask, my gloves. Well, I don't, think about this. I, all the security that's normally Doug's like that he's mad yeah, right now. All, all the security that's normally like allotted to like the whole uh, shopping center is just like the essential stores. There's only like one or two stores open. So yeah. it's like they're they're ready for that, you know. This yeah. is the only time though in history that somebody could walk in with a full mask on their face and kitchen yeah. rubber gloves, and, and that's you, normal. And you wouldn't even bat an eye right yeah. now, yeah. right? So yeah, you could yeah. probably get right to where I was you need. take my Slipknot mask and, and go down and get some groceries. That Did, might get so might get the you you brought something. You just said something right now that I've been meaning to bring up on the show because I wanted to hear you guys' opinion on this, <clears throat> and I find this really interesting. That. Uh, amongst all this uh, shutdown and shelter in place and businesses having to close, right? That's been just uh, just crippling for so many people, right? Why and how? Okay, and I don't understand why enough why people aren't in an uproar about this. How did liquor stores become essential? Yeah, mm, they sell they sell some food. <laughs> I think it's because they sell some food. Yeah, and they do, sell water. Are they, and, is it because they fall under grocery store? Is that I think so. What a what a yeah, bullshit what loophole! A slippery. What a bullshit loophole! Slope that was, I think yeah. if you just sold pure alcohol, the only person the only person who buys water and food from the liquor store are the people going there to buy liquor. They go, oh hey, I need some fucking yeah, toilet a paper. Chaser. Yeah. 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 What, are you, yeah. A, what are you a millionaire doing your grocery shopping at the Seven Eleven? Yeah. yeah. What's wrong? Oh, with they you? got limes, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's produce. Yeah. 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 No, no I think it's because they sell other stuff, you know. But hey, man, someone might consider it essential. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know. I well, I mean, it's a way to survive this whole thing. I had yeah. another. I had another theory too. Jack, will you pull this up it. because this uh, this will either. Uh, yeah, make sure it's not an April Fool's joke. We don't want to fall <laughs> for it. Shut up, dude. Those. Shut up. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be a while. I know. I'm We're still getting get some to, more of those. You know, people are always like uh, like an episode or two behind that. I, it drives me crazy. I have to remember that, like, because I'm still getting DMs about that. Hey, you idiot. You know, I'm like everyone's saying, <laughs> yes, moron. I know. Oh, come on, okay, like, you've they, never fallen for anything. Yeah, they got me, and I already admitted that I got punked already. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I don't need fucking 500 DMs to remind me too. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the, where we're at right now because I don't follow this like I used to. Where is uh, legalization for marijuana across the United States? How many states are uh, are legal for uh, recreation? Yes. Oh, okay. Because uh, I I not think many. I yeah. think definitely if, not Ohio. I if there that. is anything that may fast track this to go all the way across the United States and that actually has the potential to drive enough tax revenue dollars would be almost every state would be smart to get on that as fast as they could and legalize it and tax it. Why why do you think this would motivate that? Because we're going to because we're all going to be in a, a shitstorm when this is with this is Oh, over. you mean financially? Yeah, financially. Oh, so yeah, look yeah. at that. So more than half the country still hmm. has not legalized. So there's a huge opportunity. Well, there's only 1 2 3 <clears throat> Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, states that have recreational marijuana being legalized, and then there's a, an additional—I don't know what that looks like. Ten, wow, states all those, of, of, of medical. So you you could you super could, conservative states, and, like, and no, and we know. Uh, I mean, Doug, this would be another great stat to pull up right now. How many uh, how many tax dollars from uh, marijuana for California alone? Right? Oh, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, right. So while Doug's looking this up, just just think about that for a second. Can you think of a single thing that could help boost the economy after COVID nineteen? As strong as that? As strong as that? Oh, that's yeah. a good point. That's oh, not, yeah. that, if they that's legalize not, cocaine. Right. That's well <laughs> Yeah. One, you asked me. Hey, one step at a time. <laughs> one step at a time, guy. Yeah. But uh, California has a first. There's not gonna be any more raves or parties. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then what are you gonna do? No, yeah. I really I really th- I think you're gonna see this. I think uh, it, this isn't like uh, I'm the only one that could be thinking about this. You if you're if you are a you know governor right now and you are looking at your state bleeding right now and you haven't legalized marijuana and it's kind of inevitable right. that we're going this way. Way and everyone's gonna be, and maybe you were a conservative state that was kind of fighting it for now. You, this is what this might be. The so here, here, the California has a raised answer. California has raised one billion in cannabis revenue two years after launching the legal market. So a billion dollars in two years, legit, yeah. right? Yeah, that's a decent amount. Well, 
Here's okay. I'm going to counter that. I think with the current state of affairs, but it might be a terrible, uh, you know, reason or time for more people to smoke weed. Oh my gosh! It does. It's already happening. Yeah. You can't every the weed places that are open. It's the most paranoid the time paranoia. of all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah, but the, it, depending on the strain, I guess. Yeah. Right now, if you try and go to a local cannabis store, I mean, I was driven back to the black market because you can't get anything right now. Yeah. Mm. You can't get anything in, in in California, which we we got them on every corner. You were like almost driven to the black market. Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Wink, wink. wink. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah almost. <laughs> yeah. I got your back, dude. Real close. Yeah. Shout out to all the local drug dealers out there that are still <laughs> putting out good shit. <laughs> you know what I'm hey, hey, thanks, Mike Swit Smith, for delivering. <laughs> it. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Mikey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come get hey, me for an ounce of weed. For that brown <laughs> paper bag. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think they're going to start to try to come up with creative ways to either come up with ways to raise taxes or just continue doing what they're doing, which is print money and yeah. throw well, it at things. To me, this is, in my opinion, Monopoly okay, and I can't, I can't wait till we have a conversation tomorrow. I, to me, this is one of the smartest ways. One of the worst things that we can do that people are that are okay with is just infusing money out of nowhere. Printing money and just pumping it into it's our economy another tax. is a is a is a false, you know, uh, a false signal that we're well, doing it's better. It's technically it's another tax because the but ta more but taxing something that is already in existence and primarily on the black market right, right now is a fucking great thing. If right somebody now somebody wants it, sure. Yeah. Now the problem yeah, that just, just don't tax us. Now the problem that that, that that I'll, I'll talk about California. California sees marijuana, legalizes it, and says let's tax the shit out of it, and that just ensures that you have a vibrant black market. It okay, it does, and I agree with you here. They need to be smart about okay, it. Okay, so I here's the thing though, you're right, and it does, but it still opened the market up. St there's still there it, the reason why it's it's generated a billion dollars in two years is because. There is there's a there's a clear line of people, right? There's people like me who's been who've been around cannabis for a long time, recognize what good weed is, and knows that like I'm not gonna pay fucking forty five dollars for some shit eight. Do they have a name for that? You know they have sommelier for wines. Do they have one for weedies? Yeah. A connoisseur, yeah, yeah. weed connoisseur. That's okay. it. Yeah, yeah, that's or a master okay. grower, master grower, weed uh, connoisseur. We gotta get a better name. Stoner. Yeah. Yeah. that's what they call. No, it. that's right. a terrible right. name. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> but you you have you have a <laughs> and then you have you have people like you know my aunt. You know, our grandmother who've never messed with it, but because it's become legalized and they've heard good things that it could help relieve anxiety or help them with their sleeping, they feel safe going into a club. They most certainly are not calling Mike Smith to come deliver no, to their house. No, you he's, know, so he's a shady cat. So there, th those are tax dollars that we are collecting that we never would have collected before. Now that, and I think there's, and that that's a result of those billions. But you're right. It still has driven a market for people. If they really want to raise a lot of tax, what they do is they tax it appropriately and open it up so that more places can sell cannabis, so that more places can can it's it's available easier because they make it a little bit difficult to get to and to and to and to buy. So if they really want to raise a lot of money, if they do it the right way, they'll get way more money. But I think the way that they're doing it now, they're raising money. But they're losing money because there's a very vibrant black market that still exists for people who don't want to spend, you know, they don't want a 40% increase in the price of their product and they can buy it so easily from the guy over here. Right. It's like New York City with their cigarettes. You got you have a black market, you have a vibrant black market for cigarettes. You yeah. think to yourself, that sounds crazy. It's because New York taxes the shit out of their, their cigarettes. I mean, at the end of the day, you're right, and it's not perfect, but it still is, it's still is still significantly better than what's going on. Yeah. Like it's better than if it's better than a yeah. state that is illegal because yeah, right. then the, it's an entire black totally. market. Mm. At least let's collect a billion dollars. You know what I'm saying? It, it could be it could be two billion, and if you do it right. Yeah. Yep. But I'll take a billion dollars a state. I mean, if if that were to happen, it might actually raise us out of this when we're done. And I bet you there's going to be a. I bet you're going to see. That map that Doug pulled up, I think you're going to see it get colored blue a lot faster. You think there's going to be a rise in prostitution? I know this might be a little controversial. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> I'm just I'm just speculating right now. Okay. Yeah, you um, you mean in, in legalized prostitution or just a rise just in general? In general, yeah. You know what? I mean, I just I, I think it's slowing down. I fear that you know some people are going to resort to like like the only thing they can think of to make money if they're in a desperate situation. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. I think it's slowing down because for the fans only pages. Like I really do. I think wow, that has helped. A bit, it is. It is. It is the the. And I've got. I'm probably going to offend some people. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody. Come on. Lots of people. No, no, yeah. Not even lots of people. There's uh -huh. a percentage of people listening that have fans only pages. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else that enjoys them, they don't give a fuck, right? So if you're somebody who because they're popping up like crazy. Oh, they yeah. they are, and you know 
they're they're making some good money right now. If you are, yeah, but I think it's such a terrible long term strategy. Because, well, I, dude, I'm not yeah. by no means am I condoning it or I'm pro it or I think it's a great business model. But it's a hustle, just like prostitution kind of is, right? It's right. not like the best business strategy long term for a family, no, yeah. right? But it is a hustle. But it's and, like one of the oldest trades, uh, you know, ever. And you're able to hustle now online and not even put yourself at risk. Mm-hmm. You know, you can. You but can, do you think that that is going to like? Do you think, for example, pornography reduced prostitution because now there's more access to videos and pictures? I don't necessarily think they're the same thing. Yeah. I don't necessarily think like people who want to see videos of uh, of women through webcam and stuff. I don't think that necessarily is the same thing as unless that the girl is using the webcam you know, fans only page in order to get really good clients that she then can, you know, they can spend that provides more high end services. Yeah. They can yeah. get the platinum package that includes, you know, you know, we hang uh, out yeah. together. Dinner. We looked into that. Yeah. yeah. And see what happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. Justin didn't generate very much revenue for us. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I'm we, just looking at my options. We had to pivot uh, again. <laughs> yeah. No, it's weird. Cause then you also see uh, with Dr. Fauci, what he said about like shaking hands, like basically, yeah, no more shaking hands going forward from here on out. No, like that was like his statement. Dude, what are you going to do? You're not going to shake hands. That means you can't hug people. That means yeah. you're not going to have sex with right. people. That's, what are you I doing? Mean, come on, man. We've had you illnesses like and that. pandemics since the beginning of time, humans need touch. We need to touch each other. It's just, just uh, uh, it's a part of being healthy. I think that's crazy. Although it does bring something interesting up. Doug had mentioned, and I, I wonder if this, if there's any truth to this. He said, you know, I wonder if the, if the Japanese came up with bowing because of maybe a long time ago yeah. of that. But the, how would that's they know interesting. that? That's an interesting thought. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I like the handshake. You know, you, you, mm. you can you connect with someone. You can instantly, you know. Uh, yeah, but you're not doing it right now. What? You're not handshaking right now. No, no. Yeah, yeah. No. No, I mean, that's- Yeah, tr- what are the safe ones? Like saluting, bowing. Yeah. I, do, I do this. Uh, you know? Yeah, head nods. Yeah. The old, <laughs> oh, dude, well, that's going to come back. Yeah, that's, a, you know, I've been doing that. What's up, bro? Long. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, yeah, you look no. kind of look like a I hurt my neck the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I went too fast. If, no, I don't want to do that. I don't think I don't yeah. think they need to they need to do all that. I think right now, sure. Um, but then again, how many people are you meeting right now in person? Nobody. Uh, yeah, nobody. Hey, I'm not I, I've act- now out of the three of us, who's watching still? Because I honestly have I I went on when we were in Tahoe, right? For those. Oh, we were two, like every morning. Every morning that was yeah. a ritual. I had coffee. We watched the news. We listened to Trump talk. Also, mm, that. Yeah. I've completely just. Roast I've reporters. stopped now for almost. I would say seven to ten days. I've completely mm-hmm. just stopped. Well, so yeah, I I've dramatically reduced how much I follow, but I still follow a little bit. An interesting article was published in the San Francisco. Uh, what is it? The San Francisco Chronicle, Gate, Chronicle. Oh, the Gate, Gate or the Chronicle. Um, that very very interesting. So the article is theorizing. So I don't know if you guys knew this, but Stanford did a huge study uh, here in the Bay Area like a week ago. So Stanford set up a, a station. I think it was at Vasona Park, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow. And they signed up a bunch of people and they tested for antibodies. I think they did something like three or 4,000 tests. I didn't know this. Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. hear about and, this. And they wanted to just test everybody, not just people who had symptoms or whatever. And what they're trying to figure out was population uh, you know, infection rate. Uh-huh. Because there, we know that there's a lot of people without symptoms that can be carriers of the virus. And so they're trying to figure this out. And- the reason why this is so important in California is because right now infectious disease experts are really scratching their heads as to why California, the most populous state in the country, has such low infection rates and low death rates compared to other states. Hmm. Very, very low. We can look at New York. Yeah. New York's, you know, infection we have like they have like ten times more infections there than we do here, and their death rate is through the roof in comparison. California, very, very populated state. We have uh, densely populated areas in the Bay Area, San Francisco, you know, the uh, uh, Los Angeles, and it doesn't. And we're not nearly, nearly as bad. Now, does the are there theories around the virus thriving better in colder, colder climates than warmer climates? Mm-hmm. Well, or other way around. Well, what they're saying about what, what some of the theories around California are is that it was it might have been 
around in California in the fall earlier. of 2019. Fucking, listen, yes. dude, today is, is that the, the day. article you just found. That's the article I just found. Today is the day Sal and I go down and we get tested at Red Dot. Yep. Oh, okay. Today exciting. we go because I believe I had it, mm-hmm. and I think you believe you had it. Mm-hmm. Now, so it says in the article. So it is. It's the it's the San Francisco Gate. Uh, mm-hmm. It says study investigates. If COVID-19 came to California in fall of 2019, here's some more interesting news. We had an early flu season in California, and and it hit off hard. Yeah. And there were a lot of mysterious illnesses that were happening here in California around that time. Mm -hmm. Combine that with the fact that people are just not getting – look, I know we had the the, the shelter in place and all that stuff, but we're a – we have a lot of fucking people here, and we, and homeless how population. You, yes, yeah. and how can you be confident you could trace it just to like a specific date of one passenger coming out, you know, and like spreading it? Like, well, California has been forever and continues to be by far the the most uh, the most popular tourist place for Chinese yeah. uh, for Chinese tourists by far, and they love to right come across the pond. They love to go to L.A. And they love to go to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And that's we were some of the first places hit by when they started testing by mm-hmm. COVID or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. New York, right now, they're doing tests and they're finding that most because all from Europe, right? Yes. Yeah. They're that's finding what I read too. So because COVID oh, interesting. COVID's mutating a little bit here and there, and they can start to see like, oh, this one came from Europe. This oh, one came from China. really? Most of the cases in New York, they're finding came from Europe. Wow. So it, what might have happened is California was exposed early. We weren't really tracking or whatever we just kind of had a bad flu season people getting sick or whatever but you know we're not focusing on it with a with a with a magnifying glass so not everybody's not in panic like we are right now yeah now that we're focusing on it everybody's like why the fuck is california doing so like so well our death rates like comparison is nothing what i I gotta look it up with what what it is uh, as of right now which is ironic considering that we were one of the first places that tested in it right we were the first place in the united states that uh, it popped up popped up in san francisco or no wait washington first and then and then san francisco Uh, the bay area was one of the first places it was when they thought we were going to get hit really hard yeah they thought so check this out right new york as of right now total confirmed cases 159,000. so this is as of the recording of this podcast so when it drops this these will be off California at 19,000, okay? Wow, 159 to 19,000? Now look at the deaths. Here's the big one. The total deaths in New York due to COVID, 7,000. The total, total, total deaths in California as of you know when we started paying attention and testing, 508. Mm. 508. We have 489 total cases per 1 million, the population, 13 deaths per 1 million. New York is at 8,000 cases per 1 million and 360 deaths. Our number of 13 deaths per 1 million population is very, very low now, when you compare it to others. Now, is the one in Europe, is that like, has it mutated at all and like become a different type? Uh, have they, have it's they a, tested it's, for that? It's mutated a little bit, but they're not finding it to be more or yeah, less. Okay, okay yeah. good. Uh, I'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> no, I watched Outbreak. No, are they, are they the, the ones that are getting it in California? Are we tracing that to, to China? I haven't we, read I haven't read anything okay, about that. I, I wonder. I haven't read anything about it, but I could look it up. And, and how many, and how many like, uh, when, when I saw that Red Dot was doing that, I mean, it just blew my mind. I didn't know that the people, the people were, private people were doing this yet. Yes. Is this happening more and more? Or are you are you hearing companies what? are starting to get their their they're getting FDA approval to be able to provide uh, antibody testing um, to the population, uh, you know, through private means, which means you have to pay for it, uh, which means that they generate revenue to produce more. This is going to be in addition to all the tests that the government is paying for in the hospitals. This is a very good thing. So when St- thing. so when Stanford yeah. did it, what was the outcome? How many people had? We don't know yet. Oh, we don't. It know. just happened. <coughs> they oh, just uh, did this test, but okay. we're going to start to see the results. And what they're going to what they're going to find with it is a more accurate population uh, infection rate because like okay, Iceland I think did this or Greenland or Iceland did this where they tested just a bunch of people. And they got a more accurate, you know, uh, infection rate because when you infect, when you test only people with bad symptoms, right. you don't really get an accurate number because we don't know all the people that don't have, that are asymptomatic. We don't know any of that stuff. So that's what they're trying to figure out. I've been, I've been this is, this, and this, I'm such a numbers guy. So this is something that I was like trying to explain to my my friends that have been freaking out since the beginning of all this is that what we know that the number the number that's been pretty consistent, even with people that make it to the hospital and we test. 
97% of the people report mild symptoms. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if 97% of the people that go to the hospital and get tested report mild symptoms, what percentage of people don't even go report it? Right. Like yourself right. or potentially might. Now, I'm not saying that we did. We don't know yet. We'll find out. But to me, that just it makes you got to think a little bit that there's got to be a there's got to be some percentage whether it's 1% or 50% of the people don't even go into the hospital which would completely inflate and change those numbers it's interesting isn't it yes and i yeah i'm really interested to see what these antibody tests say for us uh i'm not going to lie i'll be really angry if i get the antibody <laughs> test yeah and uh and i didn't have it i'll be like Fuck. but We'll, we'll see. It's very interesting. But it is weird that California is just doing ex- as exceptionally well as it is, and none of the you know these infectious disease experts would have forecasted that yeah. at all. So this is kind of a theory that it was circulating way before. Speaking of New York, um, and I mentioned this on the last time we brought up Magic Spoon, is the, that is where we are sending uh, the, the boxes of cereal are to the New York Food Bank, where they need it the most right now. Oh, nice. So for and that's for all of April. So and it's already started. So for every Magic Spoon uh, purchase, they're matching that with a box of cereal uh, that will be shipped out over to the New York Food Bank where they need it the most right now that's, in the country. Magic Spoon is is one of our, our uh, champion our, companies. They're one of our partners that is just cr- crushing right now because people are ordering their high you know high protein no sugar cereal because it's high, you know good shelf life. It tastes good. You're stuck at home. It's comforting. Yeah. It's, you know, and that's a strategy now. I don't normally recommend this strategy to people under normal circumstances. I don't like this strategy that, that you'll hear a lot of fitness coaches recommend their clients. Hey, if you're going to, you know, why don't you have healthy snacks and why don't you make all these substitutes and whatever? I don't think that's a great necessarily long-term coaching approach, but under the current circumstances, I do because uh, it's stressful. It's think times are tough. You don't want to go to the grocery store every single day. You want things with a long shelf life. So rather than getting Fruit Loops, uh, you get Magic Spoon, and then you have you know high protein, low sugar. So re- this this is a strategy that I think a lot of people are adopting, which might be why they're crushing. Well, I, yeah, well yeah. I just like I just love seeing you know it's cool. It makes me feel good about uh, the vetting process that we all do uh, before we partner with a company. And I always wonder, like I always feel like you know one day we're gonna we're gonna be wrong, right? We're gonna think we love some company, and then we're gonna find out some bad. Yeah, right. Or that they yeah. do something bad, and then we're <laughs> yeah. like, fuck. But. You know, I think because we care about that so much and we stress that and and vet them and and court them before we actually do a partnership with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've just been really proud of the people that we've chose to do business with because many of the companies that Mm -hmm. we're doing are doing things like this. I'm always looking for companies that are doing it the right way right now, too. We brought up, like, you know, the whole debacle with 24-Hour Fitness and all that. And I just heard about the CEO from Marriott. How he basically gave his entire salary now to, to, to keep his his company afloat with, you know, keeping employees, uh, you know, uh, paid. So he, he, he said, "I'm not going to get paid. Not going to get paid. Let's you know, save this money. You save know who it. you know who wins all of that, right? Who? Jack Dorsey. Have you pulled Doug? Pull this up. Uh, um, you know, rich people. Uh, what percentage of rich people donating for COVID nineteen? Let's see if it, this graph comes. Mm-hmm. Up. I saw this graph. Today. Oh yeah, I did see that graph. And yeah. you're talking about you know the mm-hmm. Bill Gates, the Oprah Winfrey's. Like they've all yeah. donated millions of dollars, which is amazing, yeah. right? Bezos, yeah. yeah. And they but they show the percentage of that of their total income. Mm. And uh, Jack, so the Twitter CEO. So if you're like hella broke and you give ten bucks and like fifty percent of my income. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think on average it's it's like a it's like it's two or five percent of the, the, all of these you know millionaire billionaires and millionaires uh, money. But Jack Dorsey gave a billion dollars. So he's the only one that wow. gave a billion dollars, which is billion? Oh, which is thirty two percent of his net worth. And everybody else is like you know, the other people that are giving a hundred million, yeah, hundred million, million. But it's like, yeah, it's a drop in the bucket. But whatever, it's still wow. a lot. He yeah. donated a one billion to fund that's insane COVID nineteen relief and other charities. What a wow. champion, right? Yeah, good. I see. That's I, great. This stuff. This is the stuff I love to see about uh, you know about uh, you know successful people. Because I'm gonna tell you, you know, bro, that is a thirty two percent of your fucking net worth is a. Big, a huge deal. Yeah. That is a You're taking big, a huge yeah, yeah chunk out. You know, haters are going to be like, yeah, but he still has. That means he's got you know the three billion or whatever you know left in his account. Oh God, oh, stop! I yeah, know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so annoying. What did you give, <laughs> yeah. asshole? Yeah. Oh, I know. Two bucks. So annoying. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I want to say something that's probably going to annoy you guys, mm. but man, mobility work when you do it consistently, <laughs> <laughs> that shit works really good. 
It's like magic, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is good crazy. to have you. Good it's, to have you on board. But you know what? It's it's always a struggle for me to consistently do daily concentrated mobility work. It works so much better when it's done frequently, when you practice it often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do fall in that category of uh, you know, I, if if I skip anything, it's that because I love the heavy lifting. I lo- I even love the bodybuilding kind of stuff and my form is relatively good so I can get away with it, you know, here and there and I get all that, but you know, mm. stuck at home, I'm, you know, finding ways to create structure in my day. And to you know alleviate stress and whatever, so I've been consistent Lots with of downward dogging. Or yeah, <laughs> down, yeah, downward, yeah. upward, downward, downward, up. upward. So I've been really consistent with you know just and all I'm doing is I swear to God, 15 minutes, 15 minutes once or twice a day of you know the Prime Pro you know mobility stuff, and I love it. <clears throat> I love it, man. It's, and you know what's funny? You feel it right away. Like within two or three to, days. So Doug just walked out of the room for the listeners, and he's not in here right now. So when he Sorry walks, we talk about him. no, no, no. Oh. When he walks back yes, in, dude. when he walks walks back in, you have to ask him about uh, the mobility class I took him through yesterday. Oh, you took him uh, through a whole really? class? Yeah. So I took. So Doug and I have been talking about doing a webinar around uh, some of the some of our favorite movements from Prime Pro. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, a forty five to fifty minute class that I used to teach. I've talked about on the show before that I used to do these classes on Saturday. Uh, for old clients of mine that used to go to my boot camps back in the days. And uh, so I've been doing that for a long time and I took Doug through it. So he got to experience it uh, yesterday for the first time. And so it's something that we were just kind of playing with. And I haven't, I haven't even asked him uh, how he feels from yeah. t- doing it. Did yesterday. You put him through the meat grinder. Uh, you know, I, oh, I, good stuff. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. No, no, it's good stuff. I just, it's the same thing that I, I used to, exact same thing I used to run in class. But how was it, Doug? It was great. Uh, my hips are much better right now. Really? Yeah, nice. it's crazy. So Just what? One, I, one real session. I mean, really pushing through it and and going all out. That was amazing. Like forty minutes. Oh yeah, and and, re- and really, really concentrating on connecting. Really focused. And, well, and yeah. something that I I had him do that I I make clients do. So because some you know if you're. You got to remember as a trainer, right? When you when you're helping people that are just like completely detached from their movement and don't really think about mechanics and even even something as great as a great mobility session, uh, as great as it is, they they sometimes can't even connect how well it really helped them. I can I can see the way they move right away. Yeah. It's like very obvious to me. So what I have them do is before I even start, I go. What I want you to do with me real quick is we're going to do ten uh, deep squats together and uh and i just want you to just feel it feel it go as deep as you can follow me and i have i squat all the way down all the way up and i count 10 with them and i make them do that and at, then i do it at the end of the class to show them the difference to difference. show them the difference yeah. and it's so glaring for somebody what a difference of their their hips their ankles their knees how yeah, deep they get feedback is that everything. is a that is it so i would do similar things when i was a trainer because it's such a powerful way to communicate to a client the value of whatever it is that you're doing with them because unless somebody actually experiences it sometimes it's difficult to really communicate to someone the value of something mm-hmm. so then when you show them and i say okay do this row right now and then they do it and then i do some stuff and i now do it again like whoa this feels totally different. Sold. Now they get it. They're bought in, um, and they're more likely to do it consistently. It's a very and so here's a here's my point with all this. Do this for yourself. So like what Adam's saying, try doing a a few full squats, then do twenty minutes of good mobility work, then do ten more squats or whatever, and for yourself, just so. You could see the difference that it makes in how you're right. And, and if you think you have a hard time, you off a clamp. hard time seeing it. <laughs> What'd you say? I said it makes him awful clamped thinking about it. <laughs> what? What? It, you can also video it. I mean, it, you can see. Uh, I mean, I after I watched Doug like get down, like, he was he's getting he was getting an extra probably four inches. You filmed him getting down, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> four inches deeper into his Whoa. squat. Oh yeah. His feet uh, four inches. <laughs> weren't weren't pronating as bad as they were before. His his chest was more upright when he was doing it, and yep. so I mean, I can as a trainer, I see it right away. So if you have a hard time seeing those things as a client mm-hmm. or somebody who's listening. You know, video it. Video your first 10 before, do it, and then video it again, and I promise you'll see a difference. And to me, like like you said, Sal, that's being able to show somebody, like there's not a lot of things. Like I can't take you through the I can write I can write the best workout program mm-hmm. and take you through it. And I can't show you five pounds of muscle, an increase to your bench. Not press, right away. No, no, not right away. But I can take you through a mobility workout 
and you can feel and see a difference on how you move right away. Right away, and that's yeah. such a great and, selling point and, for trainers. And the more often you do it, the more the the, the more permanent that benefit becomes. Right, right, yeah, Bec- yeah it becomes your new pattern. Again. Totally. So um, I was reading this really good article about ancient athletes. These are athletes, uh, you know, who competed in the Olympics. You know, you know, in you know, four hundred you know, AD or whatever. or Greco-Roman times. Yeah, and, you know, because I think we tend to think that athletes today would just, you know, yeah, smoke. Dominate. Maybe. Yeah, old athletes. Like, we're just so much better or whatever. But you read about some of these guys. I pull, I, I, I save some of the most, the, the big standouts. Check this out, right? Okay. So here, here's one. Um, there was uh, uh, Keonis of Sparta. So this was an, uh, an athlete that competed in, in Sparta. And historical records suggest that at the 656 BC games, okay, <laughs> he jumped a then record 7.05 meters. In other words, he could have won with that that 2,600 year old jump at the first Olympics in 1896, and then it would have placed him in the top eight at the further 10 Olympics, all the way up to and including the 1952 games in Helsinki. So he would have been just as competitive up and this is 656 BC no understanding of modern training yeah modern nutrition Wait, pr- probably no shoes explain the jump is this the vertical jump or the long no, jump TA jump 21 feet yeah. in the air <laughs> no, 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 that would be like, it's a long jump <laughs> come on it's like guy. a moon jump <laughs> come on guys it's a long it's a long <laughs> it's jump fucking, yeah. pretty amazing right uh, yeah. Yeah. Michael yeah. Jordan eat your heart out <laughs> yeah. Yeah. something like that is amazing <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah then there was the Milo uh, Milo of Croton he had, and now he was a, a, a wrestler. Of Croton? Of Croton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, he Delicious. had an estimated 1,200 wins and one loss uh, up until the age of 45. So as if up until he was 45, he won 1,200 matches. Wow. Lost one. Now, the second most winningest wrestler of all time is Alexander Karolin. You guys have heard me talk about him, yeah, the, huh? the Russian bear. Yeah. He had 800, eight, uh, 887 wins and two losses. Just to show you the example. 887? Yeah, which is still crazy. Still well, you know, that this reminds me of somebody asked on, I don't know if it was a, something we were together or uh, to me privately, but they asked about uh, what I uh, one of my favorite TED Talks that I could share with them. And oh, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, my go-to share, like, like when I think of like the most like mind-blowing one for me was, uh, I think it's, um, Are Athletes Bigger, Stronger, Faster? I think, it's, that's, I think that's the title, but it's a TED Talk around the uh, evolution of sports. Yeah, the democratization of sport, right? Is yeah. that how you say it? You did it. Democ- yeah. yeah, I did it. <laughs> so, and and in that, the, they basically, they had all these great studies around to support exactly what you're saying right now is that we really haven't evolved that much as humans, although it looks like it to the spectator, right? You watch football and just in my lifetime, yeah. football players today and basketball players today look so much better. But really, like when they break it all down, they attribute a majority of that actually to the evolution yeah, but of science. How, how big were they? You know, like how big, how, how like, like, because fast twitch muscle and like the way that we've trained, like that has to have played a factor. Well, yeah, you that's know, for the, our modern day athletes. That's, the, evo- but, that's yeah. the evolution of science, right? Yeah, yeah, right? We've learned to diet better, which right. has helped a little bit. We've learned to mm-hmm. equipment a little bit. Like it's, it's, yep. so, and so, it's yeah. also, and we've you, eaten more calories, which has produced bigger bodies. And it's also what you said, where it, you, back in the day, they were looking at it, athletes were considered, uh, to, they, had, they all looked a certain way. There was a general athlete. A shot putter today looks nothing like a a long distance runner. Right, looks nothing like a weightlifter. It's super specific. But yeah, because now you're picking like the tallest kids for basketball right. or the you know. So back back then didn't necessarily do that, and athletes competed in many different things. There's another guy, uh, Theogenius of Thassos, who competed for 22 years in every major combat competition at the time. Boxing, pancreation, and wrestling. You guys familiar with pancreation? No, what's that? Pancreation is like MMA, except they wore leather. They wore like a strap of leather around their knuckles, and they basically would could fuck each other up however they wanted. So oh, it was it was like it's no like whole cage part. fighting without cages. Yeah. First question is from Vidal F three. I want to get a machine for cardio between the treadmill, elliptical, rower, or bike. What machine would be the most beneficial for workouts, hit, and overall health? Oh, if you well, if Vidal the choice Sassoon. if the choice is between those, uh, in my opinion, the treadmill is the is the best option. It's the most hmm. versatile. Um, walking, running, you could practice your technique and form on them. Uh, it's very functional. 
It's the easiest to do at lower intensities for a lot of people. You know, if you need to get on in there and just walk, um, it's there's a reason why it's the most popular piece of cardio equipment. It's existed forever, and it's always in, in all of them. I don't have an issue with ellipticals, rowers, or bikes. The the, the necessarily, but the like a rower I think requires more skill, mm-hmm. requires a little bit better stability. Ellipticals are are okay, um, but you're 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 limited. You can't do you can only do the elliptical. Whereas on a treadmill, there's a lot of different things you can do if you want to get you know kind of created. Uh, but at the end of the day, the one that you feel most comfortable with is probably going to be fine because really what you're training, unless you're training specifically for a sport like biking, rowing, running, um, you're just strengthening your cardiovascular yeah. system, in which case you could do that with all of those. Yeah, if you're looking at it uh, in terms of the mechanics of, of walking, running, jogging, and all that, you know, then a treadmill, treadmill obviously is going to make sense with that out of all of them. But uh, in terms of what I look for out of like a piece of cardio equipment is – you know, how, how like involved I can get my lower body, my upper body, like everything, uh, stimulated by it. So I, I, I tend to choose something like, uh, the rower or, or the bike, like the assault bike where I can actually rip the handles and, and you know, really get uh, my upper body, uh, engaged as well. Just, I just, I can't stand, uh, to, to me, it just feels like I'm a hamster on a wheel, uh, with, with the treadmill and it's yeah. just like a slow death. I'd rather be outside, you know, hiking or uh, doing hills. But for your average person, I think a treadmill with the with the ability for it to incline, I think is a fantastic option. I can actually make a case for each one of these. I, there's there's a there's a person that this is that's why the answer is always depends with us, right? Yeah. Because somebody and I, if I had to put one uh, in last place. I would put the bike, unless you say the assault bike, like Justin just said. If you put assault bike and replace a bike, I can make a case for each one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, your simple case you just made for the cycle. I mean, the, cycle, the assault bike too is, I think it, it, they've already done studies on the the ability to reach like your your max heart rate and burn the most of calories. I yeah, mean, it's real up, quickly. Right. It's, yeah. up, it's up there with one of the best when it comes to, when we're talking about just straight burn. So there's the case for that, right? Rower, in my opinion, is probably one of the healthiest things someone could learn to do. Now, because of the point that Sal made, the learning curve on it is probably the highest out of all this, mm-hmm. right? You're getting on a bike, very easy. Getting on a, a treadmill, very easy. Elliptical, even easier. Uh, rowing, most technical. But because it's most technical, probably has the the greatest advantage for seeing the most return from it, right? Like I, it's gonna if you learn to do it well, you're gonna get great core strength from there. You get leg drive from there. You're doing retracting and working the posterior train, so your back is getting involved, which we as trainers know that working on the posterior chain is so important for most clients. So I can make a ton of value uh, for the rower treadmill. Why I can make the case the same reason why Sal did. You could, it's probably the most versatile. You can do the most things on it as far as walking, running, skipping, uphill, flat. Even you can do some treadmills downhill. So I think that that one is the most versatile. Elliptical, though, if I have a client who is uh, got joint issues, if you have mm. um, a lot of knee pain or hip pain, uh, that is the lowest impact. That one in the bike are the lowest impact out of all those. So it's probably the healthiest way, and you are moving, ellipticals are moving your arms and your legs, so it actually when you measure the calorie burn in comparison to a lot of things, it may seem easier, but you, I remember when I, uh, the body bug first came out, I actually wore it, and then I did all of these uh, different uh, cardio modalities to see like how the expenditure, and w- the one I was most surprised in was the elliptical. Elliptical was right up there with the treadmill with the most amount of calories burned for the same amount of time that I, uh, that I was on it. So I can see a lot of value there. So it really depends on the person. Uh, none of them, none of them are wrong. And like Sal said, the main thing that you're using it for, unless it's very sport specific for what you're trying to accomplish, is to train the heart. And you could do that doing yeah. jumping jacks. Right. You can do that uh, jogging outside. You can do that with warrior ropes, Just running in place. Sometimes. Yeah, and and the truth is, uh, no matter which one you choose. If you do it every single day, consistently for the same time, the same intensity, at some point, the body will get very adapted to it. And then the main thing that you're trying to accomplish from it, as far as you know, your your cardiovascular uh, endurance is going to start to diminish unless you start to vary, change it, or increase time or yeah. intensity on I it. I mean, and, but you know, general activity is just good for you. General daily activity is just healthy. So even if you're doing it and you're not necessarily getting any more cardio gains or 
fat loss gains. So just which the fact one? That you're so moving. which one will you do the most? Right. Yeah. So that's the the truth is. Yeah. And if I, you, you know like to row, row. Right. So here's why I like the treadmill. For me, this is a me speaking, just for myself. With the treadmill, I could, and I used to do this. I in my personal training studio, we had treadmills and we had ellipticals in there. I had a few of them. And what I would do oftentimes is when I was working. Um, either on my phone working or I'm writing something or I want to read something, I could multitask easier with a treadmill than I could with like an elliptical um, or a, definitely a rower because a rower requires your hand. So I could put the book up on the platform, whatever the screen for the treadmill, and I would just do a slow walk. So rather than just sitting and reading, and believe it or not, for someone like me, that movement actually helped me stay focused. I would actually absorb more of what I was reading, mm -hmm. but I would walk at a slow pace. It would be like, you know, with a three or whatever, and I'd put the, the, the book up on the, on the platform, and I would just read, and I'd be there for yeah. 45 minutes just to be active. So. I didn't even mention the jump rope, but that's my go-to, mainly because, like, the, the timing of it and the snap and the power, that is a great you know, way to, 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 to translate to, uh, you know, athletic moves and just being more explosive. And it's just like a repetitive pattern that uh, you're training your body to, to, you know, respond and get that recoil really quick. Uh, and it, it requires a lot of skill. I mean, no, there's no doubt about that. Like you have to really, uh, work your way through that so you can get to the timing and the, and the body position and, you know, where, when and where you need to like add your, your bits of inflection. So, uh, uh it's definitely something though, that I always go back to that to make sure that I have that skill. Next question is from joyful JJ. My dad has started working out again, but he has terrible form. I don't want him to hurt himself, but I don't want to discourage him either. How can I help him? Well, this goes to your point you made earlier in the episode, Sal. Like, you know, get him on mobility, man. This is a it's, it, but you know, here's this is something I want to add to this though. Okay, Be just because you're focusing on mobility doesn't mean you're not working out or exercising. Yeah. Ask Doug, hey, ask Doug that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah yesterday I was really uh, straining. Yeah, it well, was a workout. Well, look here. Okay, here's oh, yeah, here's a sweat. Here's something that I want to I want to clear up. I actually said this on Becky Campbell's cha channel yesterday. There's this belief that if you focus on correctional exercise and mobility, that you're going to get slower results. That you're not going to get as great a result. So it's either it's either or. Either I want the muscle building and the fat loss and the strength, or I just want to do correctional exercise and mobility. It's actually, that's not true. The truth is you'll get there faster and better by working on mobility, especially when you look at it in longer terms, three months, six months, and a year. If you start your workout properly and you focus on correctional exercise, if you focus on mobility, not only are you, gonna, are you doing it the better way with less chance of injury and all that stuff, you're going to get there faster and more effectively anyway. So the only choice is to do it. There is one right way is my point. It's not mm -hmm. like oh, you know, I'm giving one up for the other. It's only one that's the right way. And so start with mobility. That is his workout right now for sure. Wow. Yeah, that was it. Done. That's, that's short and sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next question is from Russell Gerwer. My kids and I have been using maps anywhere. It allows me to get my workouts in and teach them a few things about exercise. What adjustments, if any, do you recommend to program for children? That's a really good question. Um, so when it comes to kids and, and working out with kids, there's a couple things that I think you want to consider. One, can they do the movement uh, with what seems what looks like good stability and good control? If the answer is yes, then the movement's appropriate. How long is their attention span uh, doing these exercises? That's too? the other big one. Yeah. You know, when I would train, uh, so when I would train teenagers, I'd say over the age of 14, um, I could do an hour workout with them, especially if I did a good job talking with them in between sets and, you know, kind of joking around and having fun. When I would train kids, because I did train a few kids, you know, under the age of 12, really, really tough to keep them in mm -hmm. a structured workout that isn't play, because play is easy. You can do play. I can play with a kid for two hours, no problem. But like a structured, like, okay, you got to do this. You got to watch your form, make sure your knee is doing this. You're, th you're looking at like 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. It's about maybe 20, 30 minutes max. For most kids, after that, you're just creating a torturous. <laughs> yeah, and, and if that's the case too, like I, I adjust on the fly. I, I try and at least get like two to three, maybe exercises that I'm like, okay, like we're gonna buckle down, we're gonna focus and concentrate, and at least like I feel like we accomplish something when, uh, you know, they can remain focused and and get 
what they need to get out of those very specific exercises uh, and, and learn it as a skill. And then after that, it's like, okay, I'm just going to kind of work this on the fly of like, let's make this fun. Let's make this engaging. Uh, let, let's add a little bit of like a game to this or, you know, something that's going to keep them, uh, you know, going through the rest of the movements. And, and really with kids, for the most part, it's, it's the activity. That's that's really the, the, the biggest part, uh, you know, kids need to focus on really is general play. And so, you know, like pulling things, pushing things, you know, running, uh, climbing, like all these are very important. Their, their body awareness, proprioception, that's the, the, the biggest uh, concern for me always with kids is, is to be able to establish that so then they can build upon that later as they develop. Yeah. So, so I, had a, I had a reasonable amount of success with this with – training my clients kids like with the boot camp class I used to do this on uh like once a month I'd let them bring their kids and we would do something uh with them and it took me a while to figure out and everything you guys are saying is like so spot on I mean it kids attention is is tough and, it, and it's about moving more than anything else and so I couldn't take them through these same series of workouts that I was taking my clients and so it forced me to try and Get creative. And one of the things that I, I had pretty good success with that uh, uh, I like to do, and, and you can come up with your own uh, test, right? So I, I would create this little test. Kids love reward systems, right? So, you know, I would, you know, whatever that is as a parent, whether that be a treat that you do or more time on their iPad or find some sort of a reward system for them beating themselves, right? Yes. So what I would do is say, all right, you know, son, this is what we're going to do today. We are going to do, uh, and I, I did this on a field, right? So I had this room. So we would I'd do go on a football field. The first exercise might be like walking lunges. And I'd say, you and I together, let's do walking lunges as far as we can. And you tell me when you can't do any more. And so we would just walk until they're like, oh, I can't do any more. That's too much. Okay. That was, you know, 52 lunges, walking lunges you did or whatever the number is. And then I would write it down. So now I know. Then we do push-ups. Then we do sit-ups. And then we do a hundred yard dash and back sprint. And I would time it. And so I get a series of like exercises and movements. I would time all of them and calculate mm -hmm. how like many they would do. Presidential physical fitness. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Something basic like that. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where this came from is like, I, I knew that this was back when that was, I don't know if they still do that at schools. But I remembered that and, you know, this would help these kids when they do, would go to test for these things. And then what I would do is just try and get them to compete with themselves. And then I would reward them for beating themselves mm -hmm. the, the next time. So now the next time that we did that, you know, if you shaved off one second, then, you know, we would, you would get your, your whatever reward or treat or whatever, or celebrate it. You know, every kid's different. Some kids just want to be recognized and high fived and, oh my God, you're improving. You're amazing. Some kids will need something like, Hey, that gives me an extra half hour of iPad time, whatever, but find something like that, put together a series of exercises or movements, uh, have them uh, test it one time. Don't tell them you're doing that. Just have them uh, see how many you can do track it, and then just try to get them to improve each time, you'd be surprised how many kids feed right into That's, that. Yeah, the measurables is a big one. Like, okay, you just put a stopwatch in front of them. Can you hold this for 10 seconds? Yeah, right. hold yeah. a plank, right? And then you put it right in front of them, and then all of a sudden now they can measure you know, off of the thing, and they get competitive, and you have a lot of fun. The other thing, too, is while you're doing this with them, um, and I love doing this with my kids, is it's not necessarily about the workout. So what I mean is if we're sitting there doing mobility or stretching, it's not necessarily about the like, do you feel the stretch? Do you, we'll get in the position, I'll watch their form, and I'll correct their form as we go along. But then I'll ask a question like, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? Or I'll say something like, you know, if you, if you, what would you rather have, super, you know, intelligence or super strength? And we have these fun conversations while we're doing the positions. And then in, while they're answering, I say, oh, hold on, you know, hold your head up high, you know, get your posture better. Okay, go ahead. Now, what were you saying? And we have these conversations and it makes it a lot of fun. I love family workout time. I do think it's going to take away from probably your own intensity and stuff like that. So it's probably gonna have to be an addition to your workouts. But one last point I want to make, any workout is appropriate for a child. If the child can perform the movements and exercises with good control, mm -hmm. good stability, good overall mobility, it doesn't matter. Barbell squat, deadlift, overhead press, clean and snatch. I can give you the craziest exercises if the child can perform them well with good control, good stability, then that exercise is probably appropriate. Now, how you apply the exercise with intensity and reps and all that stuff, totally, totally different uh, conversation. And some exercises are more often than not going to be inappropriate for a kid than others. But I know Maps Anywhere. We created the program. Most of the stuff on there 
Have your kid try it. You know your kid. Watch mm-hmm. their form. If joints are out of whack, if things are wobbly, if they don't have good control and good stability, okay, we're not going to do that exercise. You no, know? it's great because it's it's body weight. You know, m- the majority of the exercises, and this is this is just something that you can you know take that time to really coach them through that. And, and a point I was going to make, uh, listening to Adam bring that up, uh, reminded me. I I used to download these these hit apps. They were like timer apps, mm-hmm. and you can adjust the the tempo on them and the timing of it. And so. Uh, I would slow that tempo down and give them like beats and every beat they had to like drop down at a certain cadence mm-hmm. or they had to hold the position, you know, for, you know, 10 to 20 seconds. And so I would have them hold positions in a push up. I'd have them hold positions at the bottom of a squat. And it's really with kids uh, to get them to slow down is a huge accomplishment. Yeah. So uh, that's that's a tool, in, you know, in your tool. It's like you're making it a game. Here's a fun. Yeah. Here's one example of a fun, like, you know, the single leg toe touch, right? You balance on one leg. You reach down, touch the floor, touch your toe, stand back up. It's a nice posterior chain exercise. Here's a fun way to do it with kids. Mm -hmm. You take a bunch of pencils, you drop them next to their foot and say, how many of them can you pick up before your other foot hits the ground? And now they're having fun. They're bending over, they're picking it up, and oh, my foot touched the floor. I only picked up three. All right, how many can you, you know, how many can you do? And you just do this fun game competition. Yeah. Next question is from J. Lee Ann. Are fitness tests such as the standard 2.4 kilometer run, one minute AMRAP push ups and sit ups a good measure of people's physical fitness, or are there better tests? You know, I, I, I hate when people say things like, you know, I, this is, these tests tell us that this person is the best, yeah. most fit. Gen- Fitness. Now I'm what not talking it, about health. Where, where is this from? Where is that? Where, what test is that? Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to find that out because it just reminded me of our. I mean, we were kind of talking about the presidential physical fitness standards. You, you know, those? yeah, we did those, and and I remember I enjoyed it a lot because, like, I mean, I crushed it pretty much, you know, compared <laughs> to all my peers. But um, you know, it was we had like a sit and reach. Okay, we had like the one mile run. Mm-hmm. We had the the pull ups, uh, push, push ups. ups, and what else? Am I forgetting something? I think that's it. Yeah, you know, it's one dips fu- maybe. You know, so fi- messed me up all the time was the, the sit and reach. I used to hate that. I get so oh yeah, <laughs> I'd crush everything and then that every right boy there. like sucked at that. Would hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. So so here's the thing. Forget. Okay. So healthy is different. Okay. Fitness uh, is as measured by maybe performance. Very specific. Is somebody who can do a really fast 2.4 kilometer run. Uh, you know, one minute AMRAP push ups and sit ups. Do they have great fitness for Olympic weightlifting? No. Do they have great fitness for boxing? Probably not. Um, so it's very specific. Yeah, they're good at running. They're good at push-ups. They're good at sit-ups if they do that, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's it's very it's kind of a very sp- – fitness is a very specific thing. I would say what you might want to do instead is break up your performance into a few different categories, maybe strength, uh, endurance, uh, you know, mobility and flexibility – um, maybe those three, I'd say, would be the general ones, and then have a component in each one of those. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I do. I here's something that I will maybe a j- explosive jumping. This, this does smell very CrossFit to me. Yeah, but I, I will. To, and that stinks. To yeah. give it, to give yeah. it, to give it, to give it credit. Um, it, it it does have some validity because there. I always tend to go back. Like uh, I've said on the show at least a handful of times, where you might hear me say, like, you know, we talk about like. Oh, cardio this, cardio that, but I always get on the treadmill, you know, at least once a month and just see what I got for a mile. And it it is a, a gauge for me to know if I if that's getting significantly worse. Am I maintaining? Am I getting a little better? And I and I want to be able to run a mile if I ever do it. So it's something that I, like I've always inserted into my training, no matter what I'm focused on. And it, you know, it may not, it may not. Uh, add a lot of value to my, you know, map strong workout or whatever. But I want to know. I want to know. Can I still run a mile under a certain time? Right. Mm-hmm. So there's value to that. I also do this thing where I do full lever sit ups and I go to a hundred and I try and get them out as many as I can. And it, it gives me feedback on kind of where my fitness level is. And the same yeah. thing. I'll every once in a while I mess around and I drop down and just get rep out as many push ups as I can without stopping to see how many I'm at. And so, you know, it, it's a good gauge for myself to kind of see where I'm at, but it's, it is very specific. I could be deadlifting 500 and something pounds, but then not be able to run yeah. a mile because I haven't been doing it. You know, well, that's why, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I liked the, the, the standards of like being able to lift your own body weight or more, uh, you know, within specific, uh, you know, foundational lifts. Like I always want to like, 
you know, look back and see is making sure that I'm at least lifting more than my body weight, you know, or, or double it. Right? No, that's a good one. I think even like not, I mean, double is a good goal for us, us personally, because we love fitness, well, but yeah, I, as long I, as you've been in it. No, if you can bench squat and dead your body weight, you're relatively strong. Especially bench. Yeah. It's mean, a hard one for it a lot is, of people to do. But it's yeah. a, I mean, if you can bench squat, deadlift your weight, how much you weigh, at least you're pretty dang strong. You know, yeah, that's yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. yeah. The way, the way I like to, what I, the way I would communicate it to clients was, can you, uh, do you have good enough health and fitness to where you're not struggling when you play with your kids or when you run at the park or when you're moving boxes or moving the couch because you got a vacuum underneath it? Are you do you are do you have pain or do you have no pain? Mm -hmm. Do you wake up in the morning and feel like you could just get up? Um, do you have good energy, good health? I think generally speaking, those are probably those are the things you might want to kind of look like. Yeah, look if I had at. to structure it, it would definitely be like a joint, uh, you, you know, test you know for mobility, and then you would have like how much like if you can lift your body weight uh, with, with those standard lifts and then some kind of an endurance component, right? So it could be the, the mile run or it could be some other form of cardio test, uh, that you choose. Yeah. The endurance one I do is, can I do more than 10 curls? <laughs> can I, I walk from the couch yeah. to outside I, I without did, breathing? I, I did 11 curls. Yeah. My endurance is pretty good right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, Adam is at Mind Pump Adam, and me, I'm at Mind Pump Sal.